Hi, everyone. Welcome to our next Fireside series. I'm so excited to be here with Amy Lafko. Thank you, Amy, so much for coming on today. I so appreciate you. I'm very excited to be here. We've already had a great little discussion so far, so I'm looking forward to continuing it. We had a secret unrecorded conversation <laughs> prior to this. So we'll share some nuggets, though, throughout this piece that we're going to talk about. Amy, tell everyone who you are, what you do. Hi, my name is Amy Lafko, and I founded Karen Consulting Solutions about six years ago now, so time's going quickly. Um, and my company is really focused on people in your businesses. So everything from how do we design a performance management process that's going to help you achieve what you need in terms of accountability while also honoring the individual we do everything through the entire life cycle of the employee. So everything from selection all the way through to employee engagement, getting out of their way, empowerment, and then leadership development training programs as well to support all of the organizational structures. That's great. All right. So let's let's start with the elephant in the room kind of thing, right? We hear today, no one wants to work. No one wants a job, right? And they're I, I think this has probably been generational. Everyone has said that, right, through the course of history. But we do seem to be having currently a little bit of difficulty or some companies have staffing. Is that is that true or is that a perception um, just because of COVID and what happened there? What do you think? So it is actually very independent It's or it's specific to different industries. You know, we are seeing some of the larger corporations, you know, big four accounting firms, um, Silicon Valley, they're actually doing layoffs. And then we find industries like when I go to my um, favorite restaurant where they can't get servers. So it really is, there's an element that is industry specific. But I think what is common to everybody is it's gotten so easy to apply for a job that we get tons of applicants. Um, and there's not real clarity around what we're looking for because we're so desperate to hire someone. And so the challenges I find are companies who say, oh, warm body, I'll take you. And then two months down the line, they're saying, what was I doing? And mm -hmm. I think that's actually a big component of the challenge, as well as weeding out all the people who are just hitting apply all to every Indeed job there is. So I love that you said that. And let's talk about that for a minute, that because I think that we've become a society of let's make it as easy as possible in all sorts of things, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to make it difficult. We feel like the easier that we make it, the more likely are we to get people to buy our things, you are, use our services, right? Apply. But applying for employment, maybe that's not the best um, idea in making it as easy as possible. So what should businesses do who are looking for someone, um, you know, who have an open employment or a job? What is critical for them in that beginning process? How do they make it so that it's not so difficult that no one wants, doesn't want to apply, but not so easy that everyone applies? Yeah. So very, um, short technique that can apply to anybody. Um, you know, I was just on the, on a call with someone today, they had 900 applicants to their most recent job posting, um, because it has the words remote in it. And so everybody applied because it's a remote position. One thing that he does is leverage some of the indeed tools around having people make a video where there are three questions that he created and people have the opportunity to create a video to answer those three questions. That took his pool from 900 to 30. Wow. Now I have it narrowed down. And so that is a key component of it is really how do I call through those huge lists? Having someone take an extra step, showing a commitment to the actual role by answering three questions on video was a phenomenal way to bring down that component. Second thing that happens is I have some people who are saying, I can't find good applicants. So other side from that experience is I don't have 900 applicants, I have zero. And when they have zero applicants or very few, that pressure to just hire starts to come into play and we lose our objectivity when it comes to the hiring process because we feel like I can't find good candidates. So in those cases, we take a very different approach where the approach of culling the 900 is a reaction to that large number 
we want to be proactive in the way we're setting up the job postings. So you have to do some work internally in your organization first. You need to know what are we going to do to motivate employees towards success? Some organizations, the um, way that we motivate people is by building a collaborative team. And we want people who are focused on being a team player, whereas other people want individual reward and recognition. We have some cultures where the organizational culture is about learning for the sake of learning and other people where it's like, we don't have time for any of that. Go with your gut. That's going to attract a different type of candidate. So in your job posting, think about how am I going to reward? How am I going to motivate someone? And then the second thing is, what am I really looking for? Because if, you know, Jerrica left and she was your best employee, she still didn't do everything perfectly. So what parts of that person do you want to replicate? And that's where we talk about what does the role actually need? And then put that in your job posting. And don't be afraid to say, here's what we're not looking for. Because in today's world, it, people are going to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I can do that. I can do that. But when they see this job's not for you, if that can be really helpful for people to know and understand. And we want to share all of that information up front. But what I think about when you're looking at what's my ideal candidate, you got to really know what the job actually is. So when I work with clients, we start with what are the key accountabilities and not those generic job descriptions. You know the ones. It's like I read them and I'm like, oh, this could be 50 positions at 50 organizations. I was just going to say that to you, right? We'll see it and I'll say great communication skills, right? Or great writing ability or all of these things that could fit into anything out there, not necessarily that particular job description. So it's interesting that you say put in there things that you don't want. I don't know that I've ever really seen uh, a job description that way, but it certainly would be interesting to see that. Oh, I think we froze a minute here, Amy. Are you there? We got to pause for one quick minute. There's terrible weather here where Amy is, some high winds. So we had a little bit of power out, but we're back. And what I was saying was, I love the idea of putting what you don't want or what the job doesn't entail. I don't think I've ever really seen that, but that would be super helpful. Yeah. To me, I'm thinking even as someone who's applying for a job, if they're saying, hey, this is not at all what we want, um, that would make me rethink about applying for a job that does have those varying degrees of generic, like I said, hey, great communication skills, great writing skills, need to work as a team, right? I mean, those are all important things that might be important to that job or, you know, in general, but that's not specific enough, right? To, yeah, I would assume absolutely. the actual job they're applying for. So you feel like it's okay to put in there this is not what we want. And that's okay. That's a good thing. To Absolutely. Do. I mean, obviously you have to make sure you stay within, um, you know, the EEOC guidelines for sure. legal limits with adverse impact, but it's okay to say, this is not a remote position, or these are the days that we are in office or something along those lines that gives clarity because that's where some of the confusion is coming from. The other thing people want to know up front is what is actually expected, not just these broad job descriptions with, you know, good communication. You're absolutely <laughs> right. They want to know this is what the expectation is. You will complete these tasks and here's how you're going to get an A. We want people right up front to understand what success looks like in our organization. And so building out that key accountabilities for each role in your organization makes it easier to weed out people during the interview process because you're going to use those key accountabilities and success factors. You know, maybe it's that 95% of the time we expect this. Then you can ask that applicant, when have you fallen below threshold of what's expected in X category? Now you're having a real dialogue. How do we feel about salary requirements in job descriptions, in job postings? There's 
there's two sides to this, right? Some people are like, you should definitely put it in there. It weeds out those people who obviously can never fit into that range, right? It's it's just not how they can afford to live on. There are others who feel like that might not, you know, that I don't know why they wouldn't want to necessarily, but there there's there's two opposing sides. How do we feel about that? Is it does it vary depending on the industry what the job is? If it make more sense when it's a lower level position so versus some of it higher management position? Yeah. So some of it actually depends how you structure salaries in your organization. So I came out of large scale healthcare. There was a grid. You have this many years of experience. This is your position. Boop, this is your range. There was no confusion over that. But if it's a job that truly has a broad range, some organizations I've worked with have had more success when we've actually put um, this is the salary um, starting point negotiable versus putting a range. Because what happens is everybody comes in and says, I want the top of the range. Sure. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying, you know, depending on what you bring to the table, but this is the, this is the salary. And again, it's, it's a lot of that depends on how you actually do salaries in your organization in the first place. Yeah. That makes sense. Now let's talk about, so you got the Apple, you got your job description out there. People are applying, you're bringing them in. I feel like this is the next place companies sort of break down a little is the actual interview process, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure that we always ask the best questions sometimes, yeah. even for me, when I am vetting or talking to someone, Sometimes I think to myself, well, that was so open-ended, right? Almost too open-ended. Or I ask them a question and it's just, hey, yes or no, so closed. Um, but there needs to be some sort of conversation in the middle where, you know, yeah. that feedback comes back in the form of, hey, tell me about a time when, right? Do we think yeah. that sometimes we don't do a great job hiring because of the questions that we're asking during the interview process? Absolutely. I mean, and I'm not, I want to acknowledge that a lot of the errors are on our side, the hiring side. And our goal is to eliminate as much of that so that there's fewer, um, you know, Swiss cheese holes that people can fall through. So when it comes to the interview process, there's a couple things. N make sure anyone on your interviewing process knows what the um, protected classes are and that they don't ask questions they shouldn't be asking. I actually had someone the other day who said to me, I always like to ask if they have kids because I know they're going to call out. That's not a question you can actually ask. <laughs> right. So first and foremost, be careful about what questions you ask so you make sure that you're not violating the law. But once we've got that down, the other thing that you want to do is make your system for selection as repeatable as possible. So you want anybody that's in the interview process to use the same scoring grid for um, that interview process. Then what you also wanna do is make sure you're asking a consistent set of questions. And here's the things that you base the questions on. Core values, mission, vision, culture. Then we get into technical skills. You know, I think a lot of people lead with technical skills. Well, that's the stuff I can teach you. You know, yes, if you have a specialty in law, I want to know that you've done this in the past, but that's a quick, easy um, question answer. I want to focus more on the core values, the culture fit, and you brought up behavioral interviewing. Tell me about a time in your past. That's step one. I want to know about a time in their past. And yes, I may say, tell me about a time you had a conflict and how you handled it. That's actually not the important part. It's what did they learn from it? What do they do differently now because of it? So when I do an interview process, we use a calibrated question model. We pick our core values that we want to talk about. We pick um, components of the mission statement that tie to the organization. And then we ask questions in a series. Tell me about a time when. Um, then we want to ask questions like, what did you learn from that? How did that make you feel? What was the outcome you expected? What actually happened? And it's actually those follow-up questions that are more valuable. And so, like you said, Marcy, it's got to be a conversation back and forth. So it's not just, 
here's an answer I pulled from a website because that's a question I figured you were going to ask me. So I have this canned answer. We'll dig deeper. And that's where you're going to get to more of the heart and soul of the person. Well, I think that was great. They talked about, you know, the technical questions, because I do think a lot of times we yeah. lead with those. Um, yeah. And I wonder if it's not because um, part of our secret conversation before this, because we're talking about a class that we've both taken here, of course. Um, and what was very valuable for me was really determining what was my mission statement? What is my vision statement? What do I want my com company culture to be? That was a huge chunk of that program, right? For small business owners. And I wonder if that's not a deficit sometimes in their interviewing process is because they don't know what their mission statement is or their company culture, right? I mean, we talk about Absolutely. kind of a keyword out there, right? Company culture, we have a culture, but does anyone really understand what that, what that is and what it translates to for the people who work for you? And I don't know that that's always the case. And I wonder, is that part of the breakdown here when we do the interviewing? Like maybe we're not fully aware of those yes. things. And so it's difficult then, right, to bring in applicants people who want to work for you when they don't have a clear vision of what it is that your company culture is. If you don't have a clear vision of your company culture and I'm not saying it's, that in a bad way, I'm ooh, saying it's pretty, yeah. I think that's pretty common, right? Because like we talked about, I didn't have a company culture. I didn't have all of these ideas in place until mm -hmm. I took this course and really was forced to look at it that way. Um, One of the things that I love to ask people is um, what's your mission statement? And you'd be surprised at how many owners or leaders can't tell me what it is. And exactly. that is a big part of the problem. So what I hope you're seeing and what I hope people are taking away is, yes, we've got to be able to call through this huge applicant pool, or we've got to figure out that piece, but it's about having your organization, your systems really clear. What is my core values? What are my mission statements, my vision statements? What's the purpose? And then what are the key expectations of this role and how are we going to measure success? If I've got those things, I'm 85% of the way there. So I'm going to flip it for one quick minute before we end our conversation. Is from, from an applicant standpoint, I think this is just as critical, right? So if I'm looking to apply for a job, what should I be looking for in those, in that description or in that interview process? What's going to propel me to higher, right? And of course we understand that, you know, there are specifics in that, you know, I might not fit the company culture, my background doesn't work, but what are tips that I can take away so that I can do a better interview or look at, look at a description and say, Hey, maybe this is not the job for me, right? What kinds of things do they, do applicants need to know about this process? You want to think about what are the rewards that they're listing. Um, one of the things that I often will find with applicants is when I'm I'm helping them look at job postings. I always say start with the organizations that say here's what's in it for you, because they need to understand it's about um, the organization trying to attract the right candidate. And the way we attract people is by saying, here's what's in it for you. So I look for companies that don't start with the job description. I want to see how are they going to motivate me? What's the management look like? What is their mission statement? Does it align with my mission? Are the core values the same? I think those are some of the places that we need to start as an applicant. Um, and when I, I've done some work with applicants, um, people transitioning to new career fields, the other thing that we focus on is what are your natural behavioral styles? What are your natural motivations and what soft skills do you currently have? And making sure that those are aligned with what the organization needs. Um, and that's the last piece when it comes to the applicant pool for the company is I my clients all make um, an objective component to the interview process. We identify what are the behavioral skills, behavioral styles we want, what's the communication styles, what motivates this person and what are the soft skills, meaning creativity and innovation versus diplomacy, um, leadership versus understanding others, customer focus. Then we use objective data that people can't really fake as part of that final selection process. That makes great sense. And so many good, valuable tips in here. I hope anyone listening who uh, is going through a hiring process, take some of that away. I know I took some of that away. I'm really excited 
Amy, thank you so much for your time today. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everyone out there, I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope you got some great takeaways here and we'll talk to you soon.